Well, good afternoon, and I have 12 noon on my clock. Uh, welcome, and thanks for joining us today for our new knowledge session, and happy first day of summer, but here in Abingdon, Virginia, it feels like the start of spring instead of summer. Um, if this is your first time, welcome. This is a professional development workshop series that we have been doing for the past 10 years as a way to support entrepreneurs, not only in Washington County, but now throughout uh, Virginia. This is a partnership uh, with the um, uh, Washington County Chamber of Commerce, the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator, and the town of Abington. And my name is Sandy Rat Ratliff, and I am with Virginia Community Capital, and we are delighted to be a part of this uh, ongoing program. It's hard to believe that we've been doing it since 2014, and there's probably over 200 workshops that we've done in the past 10 years. Uh, just a little housekeeping, today's session is being recorded for education and training purposes. Uh, and before we get started, I want to let you let everyone know that in order to keep the webinar flowing and stay within our one hour goal, we have muted everyone. However, we do want to hear from you. If you have a question for our presenter today, please post those in the Q&A section and we will address those uh, during and um, especially after the, the, the session. Um, as I mentioned, this is being recorded and, and today's session will be uploaded to our uh, YouTube channel called New Knowledge, where you can find about 204 other workshops and will also be located uh, and uploaded to um, the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubators Facebook page, as well as the other partners pages. I'm excited on today's topic because I love Canva and use it myself for the last several years to develop flyers, videos, and, and uh, do more. Today, we have uh, Megan Nodal with, um, the, she's the SBDC Program Coordinator with the Capital Region Small Business Development Center. Uh, Megan is a longtime Richmond resident, but is originally from the Shenandoah Valley area. She's been with um, the Capital Region SBDC since March, but has been doing advising previously with other organizations. She's also opened up a nonprofit and small business cons consulting business on the side in Richmond. She has a Master's of Fine Arts, a Master's of Public Administration, and a, and a teaching license, as well as certificate in nonprofit management. She's also an artist, a CrossFit coach, and loves the outdoors. Mm -hmm. Megan, we look forward to to learning more today about Canva. And thank you again for our leading our session. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, like Sandy said, um, if you have questions, um, feel free to drop them in the Q&A as they come up. Um, I will probably, as you can see on your screen um, here, I will be addressing those questions um, towards the end of each section. Um, and because I may answer them during the session, during the section, um, and that way, if I don't answer them in the things that I'm already going to talk about, um, we're not too far away from the, the source of the question uh, before we move forward. Um, so feel free to drop them in anytime. And like I said, I'll get to them here at the end of each kind of section. I have a lot of things that I'd love to cover with everyone today. Um, but we will do um, as much as we can, um, as effectively as we can. Um, and like Sandy said, um, I come to this from both a kind of like official training um, and knowledge um, background, but also because I use these tools myself um, all the time. I use them both for my job at the Capital Region Small Business Development Center, and I use them in my um, consulting business that I run on the side as well. Um, so I like, I like to mix that um, theory with boots on the ground knowledge. Um, so what I'd love to cover today is a little bit about Canva itself and templates and things like that um, and how to approach and really conceptualize why you should use templates, but also how to use them in a way that makes sure that your, um, your products don't, you know, of, of that use don't look just like everyone else's. Um, we'll talk a little bit about a brand kit. Um, I'm also going to throw into the top two sections before I move on from them. Um, a couple of things to think about when you're thinking about your use of Canva 
um, in terms of do you want to pay for it or not? Um, and do you have to pay for it or not, depending on what type of organization you are? If we have time, I'd love to give you some other supplementary tips on um, other things that you can use with Canva um, or that you can kind of go back and forth with. You can see some of the things I'd love to get to there. If we don't get to them, it's not the end of the world. But if I don't put them on the to-do list, they might not happen. <laughs> um, all right. So I know we have a wide range of different types of organizations with us today. I know we have small businesses. I know we have small to medium businesses. I know we have governmental organizations. And I know we have nonprofits as well. Um, so I'm going to try and cast a wide net in the things that I um, provide that are useful. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that Canva is um, something that can be really useful. It is a wonderful tool. Um, and once you're familiar with um, kind of the ways that it works, um, what's possible with it, it becomes a little bit less intimidating. Um, but you still want to be um, try to keep in mind some of the principles of what we call effective, you know, Canva use. Um, another way to think of it, you might hear it called good design. I like to think of it as like, is are the choices that I'm making serving my goals for this project, right? So. We have templates, right, um, and all that good stuff. But before we get into it, you can see that I actually have Canva pulled up on my screen here. So when you first log into a Canva account, um, you will see that um, you can um, choose a lot of different kinds of things, right? Um, and so this is whether it's free or paid for or what have you, you can see that there's all kinds of different ways to get going, right? There's anything from, you know, project types, right? Um, to there's other kinds up here. You can search for keywords, all that kind of stuff. If you start to make a variety of things and save them over time, then you might actually start from a previous project, right? You might come down here to a recent design and you can actually kind of use that as a jumping off point. Um, regardless of how you get started, there's not a right way or a wrong way. Um, then what you want to think about is what's going to save me a little bit of time um, and also give me a little bit of inspiration, right? Um, so what I would do, let's say we're going to design, for example, a social media post. Um, you can do that in a variety of ways. I could come here, Right, I could come here. Um, I am going to go to this option and do create blank. Um, you can see it brings up a square. So it's assuming that I'm going to use Instagram. Uh, if you're using something else, then that's OK, too. But just know that a square for social media purposes is going to work regardless of platform. Um, and then you can see automatically pop up a lot of templates over here. Right. Um, this little template section is up in the design side. And um, those templates are a great jumping off point, all right? The more templates are available, depending on if you have a paid plan or not. But you don't really have to have a paid plan because um, what really matters is what you do with those templates. So let's say that we are going to make, we're going to make an advertisement for something for social media. Um, I would love if people have the want to pull up the webinar chat, um, not the Q&A, but the webinar chat. I'd love to have somebody drop in um, an event that they would love to advertise on social media. Whoever gets to it first is what I'm going to go with. A benefit concert. Perfect, Erica. All right. So I'm actually going to search in my Instagram templates concert. I'm just going to see what comes up. All right, so you can see there's a lot of different kinds of templates, a lot of different styles, right? You could pick any kinds of thing that you wanted. And remember, it doesn't have to be exactly the way you want, right? So let's say I'm going to pick... I'm going to pick this one, all right? Um, now, a couple of things to think about. When you're thinking about templates, um, if I were to just use this template and replace the image with like an image of my own that, um, you know, was applicable to whoever was going to be performing and then change the actual like words that are here, but not change the font. I run the risk of having a temp, you know, having a very template based design 
And somebody else out there, maybe even not that far away on social media, so to speak, might have done the same thing. And it's like wearing the same outfit. If you're, especially if you're somebody that cares about clothing, right? It's like wearing the same outfit to like a party or something like that, right? Like it's not the end of the world, but it's kind of awkward. Um, so just be in, um, be aware that the more you can use the template as a jumping off point, right? Um, then the more um, you're going to be able to individualize it and avoid that issue, all right? So I could um, pull in my own photo if I wanted to, all right? If I want to do that, the easiest way to do it is to go to my Uploads tab, all right? You can see we have all kinds of things in here. Um, I'm just not because I'm this kind of person, but because it's here, I'm going to pull in this template, I mean, this photo, um, which happens to be my headshot from our website. Um, trust me, I will not be performing in concert anytime soon. <laughs> um, and you can see that I can make it actually just fill the space. Now, mine filled the space kind of awkwardly because it was a vertical photo and I've got a horizontal space, so I might have to adjust that. Um, you'll also see that there's some edit photo options, right? So as long as my photo is selected, I'm going to go to edit photo and I can do all kinds of things, right? I can put filters on it. You can get a preview of them, right? I can actually remove the background if I've got something like that, um, which is pretty cool. Let's see if it does it. Yep. So now it's just the head, right? And I've got the same background here. I'm actually going to undo that just for the sake of things. Actually, no, I'll keep it the way it is. Um, I've got all kinds of stuff. I can erase things. I can do special effects, all kinds of stuff. All right. Um, and then once I'm done, I will, um, you know, mouse off that. And then that photo is done. Now, let's say that I don't like the fact that I have um, a vertical photo, right? See my vertical photo remnants, right? So I'm actually going to see, oh, uh, look at that. If I pull it down, I can get more of that photo in, all right? Now what that means is that I have to play with my template more, all right? So I might have to move. I'm just going to um, deselect the photo itself move it over here. I might have to move this up a little bit, right? I might have to move this over here some. Then I can move this back, right? And all of a sudden, with all I did was replace the photo, get rid of the background because I had that kind of like fuzzy soft background that didn't really, you know, tell us anything necessary. So I got rid of the background. Um, and then I made it so that I could see more of the photo because it wasn't showing up as much as I wanted it to. So I just kind of extended that photo frame down because I extended it down. I was like, oh, I need to make the decision to move these words so I can still see them. All of a sudden, I started with the template as like a way to be inspired. Now it doesn't look anything like that template, right? Other than like I haven't changed the fonts yet and the colors are still the same. Right. But it could use it even as is. Assume if we pretend that all the information is correct, I could use it as is. It's not going to look like someone else that also used that template. Right. And that's really what we're going for. Right. Um, if I want to play around with this stuff, I can do that. So I can select text on any sort of design I make. And I can come over um, to our fonts. Right, I can play around with that. Um, anything that you see that has the little crown next to it is something that is a paid, um, a paid option, right? Um, I might oh, let's go and let's do this one. There we go. Right, I might have to change the size now that I've done that. I'm just changing the size up here. And all of a sudden it should, there we go, now it fits. I can bold it or unbold it. I can make it all caps or not, do all kinds of things with it. I can change the text color, right? Maybe I want it to be teal. I don't know, right? Um, so I can play around with all of this kind of stuff. 
Um, and all of a sudden I've not only broken from the template um, and sort of to make my own individual design. Um, I also want to encourage you, and this is from a design perspective, not just a, like a tool perspective. I want to encourage you when you're thinking of designing things in Canva, whether it is social media or otherwise, um, that you don't have to include every single bit of information that would answer any question that anyone ever has, um, particularly for social media, but sometimes even for flyers and things like that. Um, from a design perspective and like a fine arts perspective, um, we want to give just enough information that it piques people's interest, right? Um, and ask them to interact more, to read more, to find out more, right? So if I've got the name of the event here, right? And I've got who's performing, what the event is, and then I've got a space that somebody can go to learn more. That's an ideal amount of information for something like a social media design in particular, right? Any more things that I want to add? Maybe I want to add that there's going to be um, some sort of like cash drink situation. Maybe I want to add that, you know, the food is being donated or something like that. I don't need to crowd all of that in here because there's such a thing as visual information overload. And we can actually give people too many things to look at. And then their eyes get overwhelmed, their brain can't process it fast enough, and they just stop looking, right? So I could take that extra information that is important, but not necessarily essential, and I could use it um, and actually do it in the um, caption on my Instagram feed, for example, right? If I was doing a poster, then obviously my format would be different, right? Meaning I might have, you know, a document size format. Um, and then I might still have this information um, and know that maybe I can include a little bit more. You know, maybe I have sponsors or something on the poster that are going to fill some of this space down here. But the idea is for an event like a benefit, like Erica mentioned, um, and for really any event, whether it's advertising um, a webinar like this or something like that, what you're trying to do is convert interest into an action, right? And so if I can take somebody and pique their interest enough with the visual that I'm making to get them to visit that site, right? This really great site.com, so to speak, um, then they're more likely once they visited the event site to actually purchase a ticket, right? To actually make a donation if it's a call for donations to actually attend the, you know, to register for the webinar or whatever it is, because I've already got them on that site. And now all I have to do on that site is make it the easiest next step. Right. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, but that kind of covers that idea of templates, right. And their usefulness and what to do and what not to do. But it also covers this idea of, um, kind of the design aspects that you want to think about, right? So let me check in with my to-do list. All right, so we got, we talked a little bit about social media, all right? We touched a little bit on documents because we talked about flyers, all right? I do want to point out, and then we'll get to questions, um, that if I come back to my home screen, right, you can see that I do have ways to make like actual written documents the way that you would write, um, let me click on that, the way that you would write almost any document, um, like a Word file or something, I can do that, right? I can come back to my home screen. I can do a presentation, like a PowerPoint, basically, right? So it gives me the right format. Um, as far as PowerPoints go, you can either share it straight out of Canva um, or if I click on share um, and I click on download, it'll actually, yeah, I know it's, let me pull something over here. There we go. Okay. Now, if I click on download, it'll actually give me a Microsoft PowerPoint option for download, right? So if you know that however you're presenting it is on a Microsoft um, machine, right? And you don't want to have to log into Canva, there's that option as well for the presentation, right? Um, so lots of different possibilities. And you can see there's just all kinds of things. There's a flyer, which is really going to be the same size as a document, but it just gives you different templates over on that, um, that sidebar, 
right? You can design postcards, um, business cards, all that good stuff. Um, so it's just like, oh, there's a lot that you can do and it can seem overwhelming. But if you follow those basic steps of like, okay, what's the purpose of the thing that I am designing right now, right? What is the essential information that I want to include, right? That's the most important stuff to make space for, right? You're going to pick your template and kind of use it as a jumping off point. Um, and then you're going to um, kind of go from there and build it and change it and stuff to make it a little bit more uniquely yours. All right. And it's just about time for me to pause and get to take some questions. And I see... We've got one in the question and answer. Um, so it's going, will we go over adding company logos to a document or post? Yes. All right. So that is something that you can do to almost anything. And that actually gets into our next section um, about brand kit. All right. So there's two ways to add. Um, there's two ways to add your company logo. And uh, thank you, Sandy, um, for that live answer option there. Um, one way that you can do it, let me go back to my design. Um, one way that you can do it, um, you can go to your uploads, right? And you can actually upload your logo from your computer, right? If it's already done and ready to go, right? And all you need is access to it in Canva. You go to your uploads, right? And you pick, oh, let's see here. I'm just going to pick... I'm going to pick my consulting logo because I know where it is, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm going to open it and you can see it's uploading it right here. Now, if I don't want that white box around it, that's okay. I can fix that, right? But I can click on my logo here. Maybe this indie rock party night where I'm performing is sponsored by my company. I don't know, right? Um, and I can size it the way I want. All right, put it where I want. And then to get rid of the white, all I'm going to do is edit photo, background mover. Because not everybody has the version of their logo um, that doesn't have the white around it, right? And then I can just move it wherever I want. All right, I see we have another question. Um, Leona, Trying to design printable signs for promotions like sales or events. Would flyers be best for this purpose? The reason I ask is I have very success with printing certain signs. Um, let's see here. I'm thinking. I guess it depends on what you mean by varied success, Leona. Um, and you're welcome to follow up um, either in the question and answer in the webinar chat. Um, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by varied success. Do you mean that they're not printing well or you can't get them printed? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Hey, I will speak up from my experience. Sometimes if you don't have the right size paper mm -hmm. uh, and your printer also, maybe the margins are different on your printer requirements that they they go off and you have to save it as a PDF and then print it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, there's a couple of different things like that. Thank you, Sandy, that that could be. Um, so it could be kind of the, the way that it's translating from screen to, to printer. Um, uh, not most printers that you would use like at home or at a business that are just kind of like regular old everyday printers. Um, are going to require a margin around it, like a little white border. Um, so there is that to consider as well. Um, also, you want to think about um, another common issue with things like that, that print like a flyer size or larger um, is the pixel quality of the image that you're choosing. Um, so for example, if it's something that you have gotten off of the internet, it is probably not gonna print very well, particularly if you want it to be large. Um, meaning that most things that are on the web are sized to about 72 pixels per inch. Um, and that means that they are very low resolution. Um, and so most printers print 
at 300 dots per inch, all right? And pixels and dots, you can essentially, like you can kind of pull from one to the other, right? Meaning that um, if it's at 72 pixels per inch, it's going to print at 72, right? Essentially. Um, and so because it's printing at a far lower resolution than what your printer is designed for, it's not going to look as good as it did on your screen, right? This is also true if you try to take a small image from the internet and enlarge it to cover your entire um, flyer or something like that, you're going to run into fuzziness and pixelation for the exact same reason, because that image is designed to be that small, right? And you are trying to stretch it and make it even bigger. It would be like taking a rubber band that's designed to go around um, a stack of postcards and trying to stretch it to go around... Um, a stack of folders, right? It can only get so big before it just like fails, All right? Same idea. Um, so those are some things to think about when you're thinking about um, printing and um, the purposes of um, printing. I do think in Canva, Leona, the flyer option is gonna be a really good option for you. Um, and then also the idea of how big you want the sign to be. If you only want it to be eight and a half by 11, then the flyer option is great. Um, otherwise, if you, you need to make your Canva design the exact size that you want it to print at, right? And we can do that too. You can make, um, you can go to create a design and you can actually do custom size and make it the exact size that you know you're going to want to print it at. All right. So, um, Kim, I'm going to answer your question live. It says, I'm trying to add a white outline. All right. Um, colored logo to make it show it better on a t-shirt that I'm getting screen printed. There's two things that I would say about the screen printing option um, is that you're going to want to talk to whoever is screen printing because adding an additional color is going to add an additional cost. Um, Conceivably, if you have a logo, you should be able to make a shape similar to that logo. Um, if it's a circular logo or whatever, and like just kind of like overlap one over the other. Um, if you have a fairly complex logo, then that gets into some pretty technical like Adobe things, like Adobe Creative Suite. And that's like a whole nother software system that I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth to today because that would be its own webinar. Um, but just know... A, that um, your screen printer, if they're a good screen printer, should know how to do the thing that you are asking here about adding an outline. They will charge you to add that outline for you. Um, but if they don't know how to do it, you may not want to go with that screen printer. Um, and there may be other people in your area. You can look at a website called Upwork, Kim, um, and you can get some one-off, like, quick um, basic design services on Upwork. Um, all right, our next question. Uh, answer, I'm going to answer this one live too. All right, we want people to go to a website to find more info. Some may want instant information. What are your suggestions to get them to go to that website? Would you add a link to click on the website or something else? Um, so that depends on the form, the forum that you're posting your um, design in. If you're posting it on social media, then you really want to have um, a link in bio tool um, for your Instagram. And you can use the same one for your Facebook. Um, and that basically can be link tree. Um, there's other ones called like link in bio and things like that. And what you do in either the design itself or in the caption underneath or both, you can say link to sign up in bio. And then all they have to do is you know, click on their little phone screen to your profile on that social media site. And immediately there is um, the link to whatever it is that you're trying to get them to, to go to, to sign up for this thing. Right. So for example, right. For example, if I go to our um, Instagram, let's see if it'll let me sign in. Okay, I'll just sign, I'm just going to sign into my own. Y'all get to see 
all the things, but it's okay because it's a public profile anyway. <laughs> um, and what you'll see is that I actually also have um, a link in bio just because um, I'm an artist. Um, and I'll show you how that works here real quick. All right, so if I go to my profile, right? Um, you can see I have a link tree here, right? So if I were to post something, like I have this class section that I'm doing, right? Um, and if you look on this post, right? I've got my ad here. Um, and then I've got a, a few little details. Um, and if I click on this, you can see it's a slider, right? So I have more information on each slide. Um, and then it says registration details are at the link, at the top link on my link tree, right? Um, if I go to my link tree, you can see that, and I said it was top and it wasn't, um, you can see that I've got that link there that I wanted them to go to. Um, and that's about as immediate as you're going to get on a social media platform. Um, for a flyer, you could create a QR code and put it on the flyer, and then they can immediately go to the website that way. Um, there's just a couple different ways like that to think about it. All right, and last question for this section. How do you add a border to a picture slash image or text? All right, so let's go back to our handy-dandy design. All right, if I wanted to add a border, the easiest thing to do is go to my elements and I can do two things, right? If I already have an area and I just wanna highlight it, I can pull up a square and I can move that square around. I can change the shape, right? If I right click it, I can send it backward until it goes behind the thing that I want it to go behind. There we go. All right, so I can make like a area like that if I want to, right? But the other thing I can do um, is I can actually go up here where it says border style, click on that. And this is while I've got my box, right? And then I'm gonna click my type of border. You can see that here. And right, I can click how thick I want that border to be. And then I can even change the color of that border if I go over here, right? Here's my red. And if I want just the border and not the white, I'm gonna keep that whole thing still highlighted and I'm gonna come back to my color from my box and I'm gonna click no color. And now I have a border, right? I can put it around um, like a square picture image, whatever it is, right? I can put it around text like I just did here. The only thing that um, Canva doesn't do a good job of just it doesn't have the tool is if I wanted to do kind of like the, what the, they were talking about a minute ago as the logo, a border around the edges, um, the irregular edges of my photo of me, right? That wouldn't really work too well. All right, let me look at my agenda. Okay, so we talked about some of these things and the options and stuff like that. Let me go a little bit more in depth into the brand kit, all right? Um, and how to make that work and whether or not it's worth it and how to get around it, all right? So a brand kit is basically a way that you can approach um, for your organization, making sure that everything has a similar look and feel, right? That's um, one of the things that we do when we are thinking about like brand identity and brand awareness that we're trying to raise, right? We want things to have a similar look and feel because it makes it um, easily identifiable for the client or customer when they're trying to discern what is, you know, the advertisement or whatever from the organization that I care about in the midst of all the other visual information that they're getting on a given day, right? So we try to make things consistent in terms of color. We try to make things consistent in terms of the font choices that we use. And we try to make it consistent in terms of what types of images are we sharing Right? Are we sharing things that are mostly outdoors if we're an environmental organization? Are we sharing things that are mostly like pet based if we're like a shelter or something like that? Um, if we sell a certain product, right, as the small business, are we sharing um, things that highlight that product? All right. Um, so it's kind of a way that we want to think about branding in general. And the brand kit in Canva really helps us do that. So if I come over here, 
to my design. Let's go back to our reliable design, right? Um, one thing that I can do, you'll see a brand, you'll see it says brand hub here, right? So if I click on brand hub, if I have a paid, paid subscription to Canva, um, and there's also for nonprofits, there's another option for a subscription to Canva, and I'll go over that in a second. Then you can see that I down here can set up something called a brand kit, right? Um, if I go into that brand kit, and which I'll do in a minute, it'll give me options for adding logos, right? These are different colors that I've already set up in the brand kit. These are the fonts that I've established I'm going to continually use. You can even get so far as to add in specific photos that you would like to use to kind of help set a style for the types of photos you're interested in portraying, right? If you have specific graphics or icons that relate to your brand, you can add them there, all right? But I can set this up. I'm going to click on edit here, right? And you can see a little bit more. Um, this can be set up from the home page. Um, and you can see these are all of our logo versions that we have, right, that are given to us. We've got our network colors that come down from the SBDC overall. We've got specific colors that we use from the capital region. We've got some little accents, a couple little accents. And then you can see these are the ones that we use whenever we do Canva workshops, right? You can see our different font options and the ways that you might use them. And then those other ones that I talked about too, right? The great thing about having the option of a brand kit is that if I want, I can just tag everything with it, right? So let's say that we're going to make this an SVDC concert, right? I can come over here. I can click on that logo. It pops up all in one on my design, and then I just move it where I want it, right? If I want this whole thing to be branded with my SVDC stuff, I can come over to one of my fonts, right? and I can click on that font option. And it's gonna give me a couple of things, right? It's gonna tell me what's already in the document. It's gonna tell me what they recommend. It's gonna tell me what's recently used. But if I scroll down a little bit, it's gonna give me the fonts that I have established in my brand kit, right? So maybe I'm gonna use this one, right? And then I'm gonna make this one also extra bold. Right, let's make this the same size. Right, um, I can come down here. I can select all of these because right now they're the same font. I can come over to my font list, scroll down until I get to my brand kit. And maybe I'm gonna use railway font, right? Maybe I'm gonna go not bold and I'm gonna make it all 24, right? Whatever, right? The other thing I can do is I can start to click on individual items and I can change the color up here, right? And it'll tell me my brand kit colors. Um, the other thing I can do is just kind of select the, have the design as an, as an overall and say, well, I'm just gonna play with these colors. And you see where it says shuffle? It starts to, and if I hit it again, it starts to play with some of my various things that are in this design, right? Um, it didn't edit this because this is actually a photo, but if I want, I can delete that photo and I can actually go in and start to add some other things there, right? And now it starts to look a little bit like some of the other things that I've already made that are all branded in the same way, right? Now you can get around buying a subscription and having a brand kit. Um, it does make things not so not as easy. Um, what you would have to do for that, let me find my, you would actually have to go in and make like a document where you make yourself what's called a brand board. And so you take all of those things that we saw in our brand hub, and you actually have to put, because um, you wouldn't have this option if you don't pay for a subscription, um, you would actually have to upload your logos, excuse me, onto your kind of like base document that you're pulling from. 
you would have to choose your fonts and say like, this is going to be my header font. This is going to be my body text font, right? You'd have to establish your colors and draw a little, um, draw a little, um, boxes that have those colors in them, that kind of thing. Um, so like if I was going to do this, come on now. Um, then I might do, there's my red, right? I might do, there's my blue. All right, so I'll basically be making my version of a brand kit into a document. And then I just have to, if I want to be able to pull those colors over, I have to have both the source document that I'm making right now and then the new design open at the same time so that I can kind of check and make sure that the colors match and stuff. So it is a little bit difficult. It's a little bit of work. Um, but if you absolutely have no budget for Canva, then that is an option, all right? I'll give you a couple of hints though about how to have a budget for Canva, all right? The first thing is that for a subscription that is the basic subscription that we have here at the SBDC, which has all kinds of bells and whistles, I believe it is about $12 a month. And that's if you pay month to month. Um, I think you may have the option of paying for a full year if you know you're going to invest in it and it's actually equal to less per month. Um, $12 a month for the benefit that you get from Canva is immense, right? It will save you time, right? It will give you so many more photos and resources and stuff to choose from. Because like if I go here, right, and I'm going to look at my elements, right? I have lines and shapes that I can choose from, right? I have graphics that I can choose from and search, right? Anything from gradients, stickers, clip art style stuff, all kinds of things. You can search for it. Um, I have photos, stock photos that I can choose from, right? Of all different kinds. And I can search for the ones that are tagged with stuff. There's even video options, right? Um, little video clips. And this is all in the paid version. There are audio options. If you are making a video and you need background music, um, and there's, you can make charts for infographics. These are like frames for you to drop photos in. There's, there's all kinds of stuff, right? And honestly, $12 a month with all that access is much cheaper than if you paid individual sites for those same kinds of things. And, you know, you had one site for photos and you had one site for clip art and all that kind of stuff, right? Because here's the thing, what you don't want to do both in terms of the way it looks and more importantly, in the terms of like the legal issues, whatever you do, please do not download a photo off the internet that is not yours, that you haven't paid for in some way, right? And use it in a design, particularly if it's a design that you are going to sell to make money for your organization, right? Um, particularly in that um, scenario, but also in just a general sense, because you get into copyright issues, right? Um, just because it's on the internet does not mean that it is free to use by anyone. Um, and just because it hasn't been marked with a copyright or a watermark doesn't mean that it's free to use by anyone. Um, and so what's really helpful, um, whether you use Canva or not, is to have a paid service that gives you access to photos, stock photos and graphics and things like that, and or have somebody that you can ask to pay to on staff to um, take photos for you, right? You know, regardless of what kind of organization you are, having your own photos, whether you're a business, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a government agency, it is that you offer services, products, whatever, um, is only going to enhance the customer or client experience because think of all of your marketing, whether it's a website, social media, a flyer, whatever, as a first impression for your organization, right? And not only do you want that impression to be positive, um, you want it to be 
you know, consistent and appealing and all that good stuff. If that first impression has the same visuals and like images of things that you do as actually coming to your business or nonprofit or whatever and experiencing the thing that you do, if it's like the same kind of people, right. Or, you know, the product looks the same and it's the same product in your photos as it is on the shelf that um, builds brand trust and that builds brand loyalty. Right. Um, And so that's why it's really important to invest in photos of your own in addition to having the option to come over to something like Canva and say, well, it's an indie rock party night. So I'm going to search my elements for rock. Obviously rocks came up, but if I go over here and I say rock music, right, then I get a lot of things, right? I might get, right, some sort of fun graphic that I can add. Now, this is not necessarily the best design on the face of the earth, but you get the idea, right? because I'm using the graphics to supplement the thing that is mine, right? My photo. Um, so just a little, a little thought process on brands, the benefits of brand kits, right? And whether or not it's worth it. Um, and then the thing for nonprofits, because I said I would tell you, um, if I pull, I'm gonna pull this tab over here to my shared screen. If you are a nonprofit and or a government entity, Um, If you're a nonprofit in particular, um, Canva has, um, you can apply for free Canva if you're a nonprofit only, all right, as like a benefit of, you know, being somebody who's not making a profit um, for personal gain. So you have to apply. It's not there very difficult. Um, It's Canva for nonprofits. Um, So if you go to, if you Google Canva for nonprofits, it's like the first thing to come up. Um, and I think you have to have your official 501c3 status and put in that EIN and all that good stuff. Um, it takes a little bit and then you can actually get the exact same services as a paid um, Canvas subscription, but for free. Um, I believe it also applies to government because government is not for profit, um, but I have not looked into it, but logically it would make sense. Um, the only thing with a lot of government entities is whether or not um, you are allowed to use a service like that because it's cloud-based. So that you would have to check with IT on that, right? Um, so that is something to be aware of um, and that that is available for not-for-profit entities. All right, so before I move on from branding and brand kit, and if there's anything else related to kind of the use and tools of Canva, please feel free to drop it in the q and A. I'd be happy to answer. I'll give you a minute to formulate. Not seeing anything come up. If it does come up, feel free to drop it in. Um, Okay. So we've covered some basics of Canva, right? Um, We have also gone a little bit into design principles. We've gone a little bit into um, branding and things like that. Um, Oh, here's a good question here from Leona. Quicker way to transfer logos from a previously paid subscription to the free for nonprofits version. Um, okay, so Leona, if you have a paid subscription and you are a nonprofit and you go apply for the free version, they will actually just pull everything from your paid version, right? Um, and if they don't pull everything from it because things have changed since I did it for a client, um, then they will be able, because it's cloud-based, they will be able to handle that transfer in a much easier way than you having to, to deal with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I got you up with another email, personal account, right? And you want to go to the nonprofit's version. Yeah, it, it may be as simple as once you get it approved um, and you apply for it, just um, consolidating those. Um, there's a way to add users um, and Canva can walk you through that. They have really great customer service. Um, and so I would be um, very comfortable saying that if you get approved for a nonprofit's version, Um, and you reach out to them and tell them that's what you want to do, they're going to be able to walk you through it really easy. Um, And then Lowell answered or asked, is Canva handle bleed extensions? So Lowell, you're probably asking about like 
like for printing purposes, like the bleed on this, on a document. Um, and so, yes, if you are making a document and you need to actually print it, so if we go back to our amazing indie rock party night, right? If I wanted to print this because I think it's the best design on the face of the earth, right? If I go to share um, and then I go down to download, if I want someone else to print it, right? Meaning I've got to download it and give it to them. I'm probably going to do, more than likely, I'm going to do a PDF print option here. All right. And then I can put in my crop marks and bleed. Right. I can choose my color profile. Right. RGB CMYK is going to be for the version you want when you're printing. Right. And then I can actually download it and it'll download with those crop marks and bleed areas already worked in. Let's see here. Yeah, so there we go. So you can see that I've got my crop marks here and then I've got a little bit of bleed over them um, so that if I were to send this to the printers, it would, um, that blue would actually be all the way to the actual. Um, and I've used Canva for that purpose before. Um, it's enough bleed area that nobody's ever had a problem with it. Um, okay. Okay. So again, if you have more questions about Canva or design or something like that, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm going to move on to some ways that you can supplement your use of Canva. Um, so there's other kinds of options that you can use for design out there. And some of them you're probably aware of. Um, well, the, I'm going to skip down to this one first. So here's a lot of um, the time we get people that have heard of or have used Adobe Creative Cloud. It's now called before, right? So this is Photoshop. This is Illustrator. This is InDesign. This is like 20 other different um, software um, apps um, that are all part of Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, Adobe is great if you are a designer, right? And you have taken a lot of time to learn how to use all the tools to their best advantage, right? Um, so I used to teach graphic design um, when I was a public school teacher. And I learned graphic design tools in Adobe for that purpose, right? Because I taught them all the time, right? We focused on Photoshop, we focused on um, Illustrator and a little bit of InDesign. Um, and I spent years doing that, right? I use them in my business now, right? I've used them for fine art stuff, for my master's of fine arts. Even with all that experience, I do not know as much about Adobe Creative Cloud as people that are graphic designers, right? It's like a second language to them. For me, it's a foreign language that I speak well, right? Um, and for them, it's like a native tongue. And so I think when we're thinking about Adobe Creative applications, and I'm gonna pull over here, right? So if we're thinking about Adobe Creative applications, you, a lot of people will think that they need to get this Creative Cloud all apps, right? There's over 20 apps, blah, 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 blah. There's templates, there's storage and all that stuff, all right? If you feel very strongly that you need Adobe, um, think about what you tend to or intend to use it for, right? Meaning that um, if you know that you're going to be using a lot of your own photos for designs in Canva, and you really want to edit them in a way that is far more um, nuanced than you would be able to get in Canva, maybe all you need is Photoshop, right? Um, if you do a lot with PDFs, you do a lot with like digital signatures, you need to be able to edit PDFs, maybe all you need is Acrobat, right? So think about what you're going to use it for and if it makes sense to get that app from Adobe or not, right? Because Adobe is expensive. Um, Adobe is expensive whether you are an individual or not. <laughs> um, so you can see if you were going to do all the Creative Cloud apps for, for a business and you were going to pay month by month, it is $85 a month for every single one together, right? A single app is about $36, right? And that's the business price, all right? If you're doing an individual price, 
it's not significantly cheaper. It might be $20 cheaper, I think. Um, the only um, caveat is that if you are a nonprofit again, all right, you can sometimes get Adobe software through this organization called TechSoup. Um, and it can get you at the very least a discount. All right. Again, you still need, you still want to think about whether or not you even really need it. Okay. Um, the other thing that people think they need Adobe for that they don't always need it for is something called is uh, video editing. Um, I do video editing as part of my consulting business on the side, um, just basic video editing. And um, I have the Adobe uh, software for it. Um, I will use it from time to time. Um, but particularly, again, if you think about the purpose of your videos, if you're making a video to use on um, social media, it does not need to be the next Oscar winner. Um, you can think about the amount that you are investing in that video in terms of time and expensive software and stuff like that versus the return, right? If you're posting a video every week, you don't want to take an hour on them every week, right? So if I go here, let's see, I'm going to do videos. I'm going to do mobile video, All right? There's my template. I've got a bunch of actual like designed templates here. I can go to my elements. I can scroll down to my videos, right? And you can see all kinds of stuff. Let's do this guy. Let's do let's size them up, right? Because it's raining today where I am. And then you can see that you can even edit how long the video is. Right. You can add extra videos to it. Right. You can title the section of it. You can crop it. You can make it faster or slower, all kinds of stuff. Right. You can put filters on it. You can remove the background on it. Um, you get a lot of editing tools for video in Canva. And unless you are going for like a super high production value, like you are making like a TV ad or something like that, you really don't need Adobe, all right? The other thing that you could use that's cheaper than Adobe, um, if you do need a little bit higher production value than this, is something called Wondershare, um, which is the PC kind of style of um, uh, like iMovie. All right, so if you have a Mac, iMovie is great, right? You've already paid for it, basically. Um, if you have an Apple computer, um, it does a ton of things, right? If you don't have a Mac, then this Wondershare software functions very similarly to iMovie in that it is much easier to use than the Adobe software. Um, it is very drag and drop, right? Um, and it's not as expensive, right? You do have to pay for it. Uh, I think it's an annual subscription but it's much less expensive than paying for the Adobe software that you may or may not even fully utilize, right? So like if I go to, and I'll answer your question in just a second, Kim. If I go to my subscription of Wondershare, I'm just gonna open in the background. There it is. Um, you can see I've got all kinds of things here. Right, let's open up one of my projects. Right, and you can see it's still kind of opening. It is very drag and drop, right? Oop, and I did something wrong, but you get the idea. It's very drag and drop. Um, it's very, it's much easier to edit in this software than it is to edit in Adobe, in my opinion, because I use them both. Um, All right, so you can see there's um, a video, all that kind of stuff, right? And it's very like, if I wanted to drag this down, I could. If I wanted to drag this down, I could. All that kind of stuff. Um, and then you can export it um, in whatever format you want. Not letting me export because I moved this video. Um, but there's audio X um, files that are free included. 
You can make different kinds of titles. Um, and there are transitions and things like that. So it's pretty, it's pretty user-friendly. Um, okay, so your question, Kim. Can you then embed that video on a website? Um, you should be able to, because if it functions on a screen for um, social media purposes, then it's gonna be able to function for the same kind of um, resolution on a similar screen for like a website. Um, in terms of embedding, that gets into like website building, which is not what we're covering today. Um, but if you have somebody that builds websites for you already, then um, they will know how to embed um, a video that you create. All right, and I think, oh, I had two more things I was gonna go over and then I was gonna ask if anybody wanted to go over whiteboards, but I see Sandy is up. Sandy, did you have something that you wanted to ask or add in? No, I just wanted to let you know we're at our uh, one o'clock, it's hard to believe. Okay, cool. I, for some reason, I had in my mind it was one fifteen. Thank you for going in um, on or popping in. on. But go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'll, the last thing I'll say um, is that these are two websites, and I don't really need to show them to you. I'm just going to highlight them here, that you can use for very high quality stock photos if you want something in addition to Canva. Canva already has a bunch of stock photos, photos right? Pixabay is free. Um, and has paid options if you want them. And it's literally Pixabay is the name of it. And then Scope EO is paid, but they're very high quality. And every once in a while, they will do a sale where you can get a lifetime subscription for like $50. All right. So if you sign up for emails from them, they then you will find out when they get the when they put those sales on. And they're very nice images. They're high quality. Um, they're done very well. And they are not your typical stock images, meaning they're a little more creative, they're a little more individual, which is why I use them, right? It helps you kind of stand out a little bit. Um, and that really was the last thing that I was going to cover. You've got um, one more question from Kim. Yeah. All right. One more question from Kim. You're talking about the code for embed, Kim. Uh, that's what it sounds like. If you are going to embed it, what you would actually need to do I believe is download the MP4 and then you may actually have to upload it into the website. Um, and so that's the difference between like a link for embedding something and actually like having the video embedded into the code that the website is built with. And that gets into a developer role um, that is a little bit past my pay grade. But I do know enough to know that if you make it in Canva, you do have to download it and then be able to upload it into the site that um, your website is on. Yep, you got it. All right. Um, I'm going to make sure Sandy has my email if she doesn't already, because I think she does. Um, and if anyone has any other like 10 minute or less questions that I can answer immediately over email, I'm happy to do so. Um, Sandy will have my email. Um, and other than that, it's been great to share things with you and give you my thoughts and knowledge about um, design tools and thinking about design and all that good stuff. Thanks, Megan. I, I, I've been using Canva for a number of years, but you've taught me several uh, key things. So I appreciate it. And I also sure. want to thank you for your time. I know that um, you have a lot going on and we could not do this program without folks like yourself, given of your time and expertise. So thank you. Of course. Um, I just wanted to share with folks, uh, I want to introduce someone that that's going to be leading our next series of new knowledge sessions. Um, that is Courtney Stringer. Uh, Courtney is the director of engagement with Wellspring and with the Grow with Google Virginia. So, um, Courtney, could you share with folks what's going, what's coming up starting in July through December that we're going to be focusing on on our new knowledge program? Absolutely. Megan, thank you so much. That was so helpful. I also have used Canva a number of times and I learned so much today. So I have a ton of notes and I'm excited. Um, so as Sandy said, I just switched um, to a new position with the Wellspring Foundation. So we'll need a lot of those tools um, since we're new getting started on doing a lot of our marketing. So 
So I am the digital coach with Grow with Google. Um, I was hired by Downtown Withful. The Grow with Google program partnered with Main Street America to really bring digital um, business tools to our Main Streets and their small businesses to help them. They saw that there was um, a major um, lack of digital tools whenever COVID hit, and they wanted to equip our um, small towns with all these business tools for free. So we'll be offering 10 um, sessions starting July 12th through December the 6th, and they will be digital training tools um, with the Google platform, and it will be some of the Google um, trainers and then also myself teaching some of the classes. So we um, look forward to having those and hope you all can join us. Um, I know Sandy has the list of all of those, and we have started publicizing that on our um, downtown with full website as well. I'm Thank happy you. to answer any questions. And uh, what I will do is, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this workshop, we are recording this and we'll be posting it up on YouTube and the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubators Facebook page. So I will send a follow up to everybody that participated today with that link, as well as the flyer and how you can find out more about the upcoming uh, grow with Google. And thanks, Courtney. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I don't know many people that do not have a Gmail account or anything like that. And that's one of the things you got to have before you, when you sign up is to make sure you have a Gmail account uh, to be able to, to do this. So thank you so much for leading that. And Kathy, thank anything you, you want to share? <laughs> no, I don't have any words of wisdom today. <laughs> Other than thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Megan, for uh, participating in our new knowledge programs. We can't do this without lots of partners. Thank you. Um, and just so you know that we have a good archive of new knowledge sessions over the past 10 day or 10 years. Um, I think I looked uh, last week. Uh, yesterday, and we have over 204 videos that we've done, and that's available on demand. So just go to new, uh, go to YouTube and, and type in new knowledge, and you'll find those. Again, thank you uh, for uh, joining us today. And um, don't forget, our next session is on July the 12th. That's Digital Skills for Everyday Tasks. And Courtney will be leading that. And um, I hope to see you on um, the next 10 sessions going through the end of the year. Thank you and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, ladies.